we manage it. And part of that then is uh, how do we get the boots on the ground to make sure that uh, as technology is developing or as we're testing or as people are putting in applications uh, as part of their building permits or as they're looking to upgrade their septic systems, they can actually get a human being um, to, to get them to where they need to go. Um, and this is not a criticism, this is a practical reality. And we've talked about uh, creating uh, common uh, building um, uh, applications, and we've talked about creating uh, a common system for how you get through then uh, all the layers that need, that need to happen, including then the health department, which uh, both for practical and by default reasons is the one that tends to be the hardest one to get through. It's a, it's a, it's a complicated, uh, approval process, but for good reason, and I defend it for that because I, it, it's there to make sure that we are building things well in terms of how it does impact the environment and how the septic and cesspool systems are, are dealt with. But I do think that the idea that we create a regional plan that doesn't only speak to what is uh, the systems uh, that we uh, find to be adequate and the right kind and meet a standard, but how do we get it so that people can, in a timely and practical way, uh, get them in the ground, get them inspected, uh, get them improved, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that that's part of the plan. And I think the other part of that has to be uh, the funding part of it. Uh, we know this is gonna be costly. Again, part of what the Clean Water Technology Center is to look at is not only uh, creating systems that meet a standard, uh, but making them affordable, making them so that th this is something that we can do uh, without breaking the bank, but also creating a data system for understanding how do we create a, a standard that has some reality. And I just want to say this because I, I, there's a lot of talk about setting standards that we all then have to meet. I just want, because I've had a real problem with that, and I don't want to say I've been vindicated, but look at what's happening today with Volkswagen. That we're trying to meet a standard, they knew they couldn't meet the standard, so now it's all blown up in their faces, and it turns out that pretty much every other auto manufacturer is dealing with the same things. They fudged the numbers because they knew they couldn't meet the standard that was out there. So I say that as a great word of caution. Yes, we need to set standards, but we need to set a standard that is supported by real data, real research. And again, the Clean Water Center will act as a tool for that as part then of informing um, a regional plan uh, and a standard setting plan, but also an approval plan. And, and I think that's how we have to look at this very holistically. So let me, uh, I'd like to ask another question on the water quality uh, conversation we're having, and then I'd like to transition uh, to look at some of the coastal resiliency. Um, so start, starting down the other end of the table this time, um, I'll, I'll speak very personally for a second. I, I, I take heart and have faith that uh, the good work that is described here, the good work that has been so hard to get funded uh, for uh, looking at water quality will give us new solutions in the future. I believe that. Um, we have a crisis now. So if we are to accept that my description of the future is accurate and focus on two or three things that can happen, what are your recommendations for things that either at the municipal or the county level we desperately need to do either changes to code, changes to practice, staffing. You know, we have $150 million, I believe, shortfall, uh, budget shortfall, uh, or deficit, excuse me, is a better word. Um, I'm not sure it's a better word. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Either one hurts. Uh, at the county, you know, and so we, we've got, you know, we've got problems, and we've got, you know, uh, funding, uh, you know, problems on top of problems. What can we do? within uh, reality over the next you know, one to five years that begin to turn the ship while we wait for technology to hopefully deliver us, if that is. Uh, You're looking at me, so do you want me to start? Yeah, please. Okay. Uh, I think that one of the things that people always worry about, and both inside and outside of government, is you know, how are we using your tax dollars best? 
you know, and we, we have too many scary uh, examples in history of how taxpayer dollars were not used well. And look back and say, ugh, should have been done differently. And, and I think that this is one of those situations where we have to make sure that we are not penny wise and pound foolish or vice versa. So the planning part and, and the mapping part of this is so crucial to me. And we've started that. Uh, the county's uh, large uh, way, uh, water uh, resource management plan, um, as well as how we've approached it in the town of East uh, Southampton, is where we started to very uh, comprehensively map, looking at what are the sources of pollution, where are they coming from, and what kind of solutions do they require? Understanding that if you're trying to deal with the pollution that's going into to a pond is different than looking at what might be coming uh, from a subdivision into a canal, uh, or what might be different than what you're looking at uh, in a commercially dense area, or might be looked different than what you're looking at in the beachfront uh, development, et cetera, et cetera. And so really looking at that and understanding what do we have before us and what in the end becomes the right map for how we best address it um, so that we're not putting systems in one place that may not be the right for that, spending the money uh, on a, you know, a, a cluster system that may not be the right thing for, for that particular area, et cetera, so that we're not uh, wasteful spending here. And part of that too, I think, is you know we've we've had a lot of pressure to uh, to fund uh, upgrade uh, plans. You all are familiar with the oil uh, tank replacement uh, uh, incentive programs. So we've had a lot of pressure. Well, why don't you do that um, to upgrade uh, septic and cesspool systems? Sounds great, right? Sounds great. You can all come to us and say, I don't like my cesspool. I think it needs to be upgraded. So will you give me incentive dollars? I think that's not a bad thing, but until we have the technology in there that actually will solve the problem, so we're not spending your taxpayer dollar to put more of what's already failing in the ground. So I, I have to, sorry, whoa, that was louder than I thought. I, I have to push back a little bit on that because you know we have a large percentage of septic systems, and I'm speaking in, uh, in East Hampton Town. Now. And you are, you and I are about to agree with each other. Mm -hmm. These things are sitting in groundwater. And, we, and that's we, what I'm saying. That's yeah. where I think we have to have the protocols today where we prioritize what we know is already at a crisis and where it's better that we do something than nothing. But I think that's different than saying we're going to give a dollar to everyone who comes without prioritizing the ones that are at the crisis point. And that's part of proper planning around those dollars. No, Larry, please. In East Hampton, I think we're fortunate because you know we identified our harbor protection overlay district a number of years ago. I mean, that identified the areas that where you know, the land was having a significant impact on water bodies, you know, and the town put some protections in uh, to its zoning and, and, and regulations to try to protect those harbors uh, by protecting the land around it. Obviously, it's not been enough. Um, we also have the advantage of having done the comprehensive wastewater study that has identified many, uh, many areas where there are high concentrations of faulty uh, septic systems. You know, you know and, 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 and certainly the technology, you know, it's gotta be done right. I agree with, I agree with that on this. Um, and we also need, we certainly need the technology for the better systems that are gonna remove nitrogen. I mean, part of the, part of the problem here is that if, if you're, you know, if you're in a low-lying area and you have a house uh, and you upgrade your septic system and it moves it 100 or 200 feet away, but it's still in groundwater, you haven't solved the problem. So removing nitrogen, you know, the systems that, that remove nitrogen are really critical to this. But, but think of it uh, this way. Um, if, we ha if, we, if we have a program in place and the community were to vote for using part of the CPF funds to help replace under some, you know, logical uh, incentive plan, that, you know, and if it costs $30,000 for an upgraded septic system, a, a, a new technology system that costs, say, $30,000, you 
you, know, you, you know, the CPF program in East Hampton generates, for the last few years, has generated almost $25 million a year. 20% of that is $5 million a year. You can replace a thousand septic systems in, um, you know, like five years. Okay? And, and, and that would have, I mean, you know, look, let's, let's step back for a minute and remember what the problem is that we're trying to solve. We're, we're into the details of this, and I think this is really helpful. We have to ask ourselves as a community, how important is it to have clean water bodies where we swim and where we recreate and where we scallop and where we shellfish? How important to that, you know, it's probably, if you think about it in terms of this level of importance to this community, it's probably one of the most important assets that we have. And, you know, there is going to be an opportunity to protect that asset and to improve that asset. And it's coming, I think, fairly quickly because indeed the county has made a priority to try to find the technologies that are going to be available to us to help with this. And there may be a funding mechanism that you'll have an opportunity you know, to vote for. So in the end, I think these things are going to come together fairly quickly. I'm not quite as pessimistic as you are. Uh, but I think we have got to work hard every day to get there as soon as we can. So uh, County Executive Ballone, two things that the county can do in the next five years that aren't uh, dependent on uh, new technology. Well, I think we need to improve uh, the advanced systems, which we're actually uh, working on. I, I can't accept that answer. I'm looking for non-technology. What, what are no, two things? Non-technology. Absolutely. Yes. Um, well, we are right now working on, as I mentioned earlier, developing the contract infrastructure that's very important. And we're working on developing uh, a program that will allow for the financing of uh, these systems. I think what Anna was talking about, and Larry following on that, it's very important, I think, right on point. You don't want to waste uh, dollars here. We're going through a process now looking at the county as a whole. And essentially, you know, we sort of understand on the western end, sewers are going to be more. Uh, as you move east, cluster systems are going to start to make more sense. As you get to the east end, advanced on-site single home systems are going to make sense. That generally, that's what we have an understanding of. But to Anna's point, very specifically, it is important to know that these are the areas that you're going to do cluster, these areas you're going to steward, these areas you're going to do. Because you don't want to be putting in a certain technology now. You certainly don't want to be uh, putting in, having homeowners put in advanced on site systems in a place we're going to end up sewering at some point. You know, so the importance of making sure we're doing the due diligence necessary to make sure that we're doing this right. But I think the, the notion that we take the areas that are the most um, uh, at risk now, I think that is exactly right. I think that's exactly what we should be doing. And you know, we'll be partnering with our uh, local partners to help do that. So I'll, I'll I'm hearing, um, without you having used this word, mapping and understanding uh, where we need to focus attention uh, as one answer. I'll, I'll ask a slightly different question. What either policy or staffing level changes would you like to see at the health department in the next five years? necessary to get the job done. I um, had said quite publicly, quite clearly, uh, on numerous occasions that solving this problem is the top priority of my administration. Now, if I had no intent of doing anything on this issue or making progress on this issue, I wouldn't have said that. I wouldn't have said it publicly. But, you know, the fact of the matter is, that is exactly my intent. I expect to be held accountable for it. And, and it, look, it's not going to be solved overnight, um, but you have a lot of people here who are committed to 
uh, making progress uh, on this issue. So here's my view on staffing. I, I came into county government and I was told that county government had been cut to the bone. I knew that was nonsense. I knew it was nonsense. I've been an executive for 10 years. I've run government. I don't believe in waste. I don't believe in inefficiency. I believe in the importance of government and the importance of the services that we provide, but I do not believe in wasting taxpayer dollars. I came in, we had a $500 million deficit, $200 million structural gap. We've eliminated that deficit. We've cut the structural gap in half. The reality is, though, we are 1,100 fewer positions than we were in county government. Now, I never did a higher increase, but we have reduced the size of the government um, by 1,100. We still have a structural gap besides that, and you obviously were referring to that, Jeremy. So we still have financial challenges and fiscal challenges, but we have come a long, long way. So we are still hiring. We're adding more in the area of, uh, of economic development, people still have 911 dispatchers. That we have, there will be areas of government where we will probably shrink still. There will be areas of government that we add, and it will be based on what the need is, based on what we are trying to accomplish. We will not just add positions because we used to have this many, and now we only have this many. Uh, that would suggest that the government does not change, or we do not become more productive, more efficient, based on the changing world, based on new technology, based on new methods, based on you know uh, different applications that uh, you apply to problems. So uh, it's a very um, moving target. So I, I don't look at it that way. I look at it as, what are the problems we're trying to solve? Identify it, make your commitment to it, and then what are the things you need to do to solve it? If that requires significant increases in staffing at the health department, I will do it. Uh, I'm not suggesting that it does, but whatever is required, I will do. Um, the, the last sort of quick follow-on here, and then I'd like to transition. Uh, what's an appropriate time frame for us to know from you whether or not we need to increase staff at the health department? <laughs> But I, I do want to, uh, starting again down at this end of the table, um, you know, we, we have the, the Army Corps of Engineers uh, coming in um, probably to, they've already started staging equipment uh, in Montauk, and this is for the, the downtown Montauk, uh, you know, a, a manufactured dune uh, construction project I, I think everyone's familiar with. Uh, construction is meant to start in earnest after Columbus Day. Um, you know, obviously, uh, you know, Mother Nature has uh, has a role to play here. And as I, I said in my opening remarks, the beach looked very different uh, two weeks ago than it does today. Uh, I think that somebody went out there two weeks ago and said, where, where do you put over 14,000 sandbags? There, there would have been a spot on the beach to point to. Uh, I'm not sure that same uh, statement or conclusion could be made today. Um, you know, county executive, starting with you, um, you know, the county has a role to play here, obviously. Um, while the town of East Hampton is the local sponsor for this project, uh, the, uh, the county, uh, through the legislature, and I'm sure in consultation with your office, has agreed to, uh, at least in principle, although I, my understanding is an intermunicipal agreement has not yet been signed, to pay 50% uh, of the uh, annual maintenance costs here. And I, I wanna ask you to uh, address that issue. Um, what do you see as the county's role here? What, what is the motivation for the county to participate and what will be the county's role going forward with this project? Well, the motivation is that this is a part of the county. It's an incredibly important project. And, um, you know, we wanted to do our part to help move it forward and, and we take our lead uh, on issues like this we're going to work with the local community and you know what their objective is what they want to do and, and you know again when um, it's an issue that involves uh, something of real significance the county should be playing a role to support and help uh, make it happen so that was really the, the, the genesis of um, you know working with the town of East Hampton to say what can we do to help move this project uh, forward. 
And uh, I, I think it's important that I, you know, Larry can talk a lot more about it, but I think it's important to keep in context this is, um, you know, part of the overall FIM project. This is FIMI, which is a temporary, the notion that we want to get the sand uh, protections onto the beaches as quickly as possible as a, as really a temporary measure. For then the larger Farah Lamanto Point uh, uh, reformulation study, which went on for 50 years, that is now being funded because of Superstorm Sandy and, and, and the work of uh, Senator Schumer and, and our federal um, team. Uh, so this project is, is meant to, to be uh, temporary while the larger planning and, and everything is done to, to implement the, uh, the more permanent solution and, and back to your form of planning, the importance of planning. And I think in a real opportunity here to be uh, planning for what that uh, permanent, uh, more permanent thing is. Uh, before I uh, ask the supervisor, can want to reflect on this. Um, it, Am I accurate that the county has not yet formalized the intermunicipal agreement with the town? Yeah. Larry, you're shaking your head. I, I don't know which way you're. It, it, it has been. Agreed. It has been executed. Okay. Yeah. All right. Great. Right. We, we, yes. have, we oh. have such. An <laughs> we have such an agreement. It's mixed. We have such an agreement with the county executive. Okay. Uh, and 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 thanks to Jay, actually, uh, I remember appearing that day before the county legislature, uh, and uh, you know it's not always easy sometimes to get. East End projects approved for funding, uh, as Jay could speak to, and you're only two, good <laughs> two, two legislators out of, out of 16. Uh, but we came out of that meeting, I think, with a 17 to 1 vote or 16 to 1 vote. And uh, Jay played a big part in, as did the county executive, uh, in supporting that commitment from the county, which uh, um, we saw. Your question was. There you go. Army Corps. <laughs> well, well, let, perhaps okay. you could provide us with a little update. I'm not sure we all have. Uh, okay. let, 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 let me just spend a couple of minutes just on that. I haven't really had a chance to talk about postal policy. And, you know, it was a big part of what the conversation was supposed to be about today. And we spent a lot of time talking about water quality. Um, you know, for, you outlined, I think, some of the things that we're doing. And clearly, the $250,000 grant that we sought and received. Uh, from the state for the coastal assessment uh, and resiliency plan is a key component of our planning going forward. Uh, and as has been said, you know, I mean, one of the purposes of this is to reevaluate uh, what our coastal policy is and to look at, you know, the, the new modeling of what flooding and potential damage we can be look at, looking at in the light of the sea level uh, uh, rise, and examine, you know, the potential impacts. Uh, that events can have on our uh, shoreline and our and our man-made environment as well, because I, I agree, and, and have, you know, we sought this funding in part on the basic premise that uh, it's certainly a lot better to make these decisions in advance. I mean, we need to sit down as, as a community, uh, and this uh, study is going to give us an opportunity to do that. And we're going to have to look at some of these models, and we're going to have to ask ourselves. You know, if this occurs, what are we going to do? How are we going to rebuild? How are we going to do something smart uh, to avoid the situation that we're, you know, that we're currently currently in? And it's much wiser to make those decisions ahead of time when cool uh, heads prevail than it is to react and to do it in a crisis and to do it under the emotion of what happens after a major uh, catastrophe. So a big part of what we're doing. Uh, is the resiliency uh, plan. And we look forward to getting that underway uh, now. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about is uh, a different model, uh, uh, and, and that is the $10 million grant that we sought and received to restore the Napi Lazy Point floodplain. Uh, and, and that's really you know, a, a model, I, I think, uh, that we should be looking at uh, throughout the country. Uh, for how to deal with this issue of sea level rise, uh, development that's occurred you know, in places where we now know we're very uh, vulnerable. And, and that $10 million grant that we got from the federal government is going to go towards buying improved structures in the Lazy Point area 
an area where, if, uh, you know, if you just go down there, some of you have seen the house on stilts that's, you know, now 75 yards out into Gardner's Bay that was once on land. Um, you know, during major events, our emergency responders are going there, you know, in the middle of the night in boats to try to rescue people who maybe didn't make a wise decision to leave their house. So that $10 million is going to go towards buying houses, carrying them down, buying vacant lots so they won't be built on, and restoring an entire floodplain uh, to avoid uh, you know, future damage to physical structure and to avoid putting people you know, in harm's way. The Army Corps project is the best project that we're going to get. You know, and I know it's controversial. Uh, would it have been the project that I would have designed from day one? No. I would have preferred to have the federal government pay to pump $20 million worth of sand on that beach. But the Army Corps of Engineers refused to do that. They would not, you know, that, you know, they would not justify that project. So, you know, we took that project from a rock wall to sandbags and additional sand. Uh, and that project is going to begin. Uh, it's actually, it's, they're mobilizing for it uh, now, uh, and construction is going to begin on October 13th uh, of this year. Um, and, you know, look, downtown Montauk's in a, you know, you know it's in a vulnerable place. Uh, you know, it, it is an important economic engine in this community, certainly in Montauk and, and for the town of East Kansas. Indeed, we argue that it's an important economic engine for the, the county of Suffolk. Certainly the motel tax and the, and the revenue, uh, sales tax revenue that generates uh, is a key part of our economy. And it's in a unique situation. It's a tiny little, you know, isthmus there, you know, separating the ocean from Port Palm. And, and it's unique in, in many ways in that regard because there are not very many downtown areas, you know, commercial centers on Long Island that are in such a vulnerable spot. So providing some level of protection there, and this is the best we're gonna do, uh, is, um, is necessary. Uh, and I, I agree, a lot of people are skeptical about this. Uh, it's taken a long time, forever, you know, to get to realization, but the best long-term scenario here is for FIM to get adopted uh, and for the and, and by the way, FIMP is also. I mean, you know, the appropriations yeah. for that have been made. I think it's close to a billion dollars, eight hundred million. Uh, it's been approved by Congress. Uh, it's been authorized. Uh, the Army Corps is supposed to be coming out with their draft plan uh, in 2016, and hopefully that will provide a real long-term uh, uh, beach restoration project for downtown Montauk. And, and, and I would. Uh, hope uh, for ditch planes as well. So, yeah, so this is going to be an opportunity for planning and the importance of working together, everybody having their voices heard, building a consensus, and then moving forward. Because the last thing we want to see happen after 50 years of having this thing studied, and the money there is that we cannot come to a consensus and the money gets pulled to go somewhere else. So the money's there, now's the time to do the planning, do the work and build the consensus and move forward. So we, without being unfair, um, we're, we're gonna lose uh, the uh, county executive to another commitment in just a couple of minutes. Um, as Supervisor Thornholz, do you wanna share a couple of thoughts on this before we go to public questions? No, let's go to public questions. <laughs> All right, well, All right. Uh, it's, it's, uh, Lou, right over here. Okay. And we, we have sure. a wireless. Sure. Uh, yeah, ask you to use that, just, and please do use that so that the camera can record it. Okay, I have a question for the county executive. Actually, I had this question before the discussion, and I think I've gotten the answer for now, so I'll just rephrase it and give you the answer that I heard, and you can confirm to me whether <laughs> I'm on this Okay, so my question, my question was, my question was, there was a federal law that, uh, outlawed cesspools, high capacity cesspools in 2000, and they had to be done away with by 2005. Um, so my question was, has that ever been enforced by the county? And the answer that I perceived was that, number one, uh, as Jeremy 
Army said, there's 196 applications in front of the uh, uh, Board of Health, Department of Board of Health, and they're on a backlog. They're not going to get to it. I'm sure they're never. We got limited time, Lou. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, it's a matter of money, basically. You just don't have the money. We have all these great solutions. But when it comes to implementing everything, it comes down to money, and you just don't have the money to uh, get the troops on the ground. It's, it's, it's nothing to do with troops. There's the, the, look, we can enforce it tomorrow. There's nothing to do with troops. It is, you, you have to have the solution in place in order to force something. I'm not going to enforce something, and I can't speak to what happened in the past. I assume, it, that I, I'm not familiar with that law, but I'm assuming it hasn't been enforced. I'm not going to enforce something that we don't have any workable solution in place to get done to enforce. you got to have a solution in place before you can go to homeowners and say, you must do this, you have to do this. Um, Which we were actively engaged in working to do. Um, hey, same side of the room, uh, easy to mic transfer. Kevin. Thank you. Kevin McAllister of Defend H2O. Uh, this is for the executive. Um, the panel, I, I fully appreciate the complexities of trying to transition to advanced systems for uh, residential properties. But when you came into office, actually uh, in conjunction uh, with you coming into office, four new advanced treatment systems were approved for intermediate flow, 1,000 gallons or greater. So my question with Article 6, the code that governs uh, septic systems, why aren't these being mandated? Uh, for new development in that scale. Um, to the supervisor, uh, you know, I just read in the paper, we have two new uh, um, housing developments coming in, affordable housing developments that very likely fall into that scale. So we, are we going to start to implement these units or continue to kick the can down the road? So I, look, I, Kevin, and thank you for everything you've done on this issue um, to bring it to the point where public policy makes very much focused on this. Um, we, we are, I'm as aggressively as I can with the, the, the water quality experts in the health form working to um, get approved systems. So, as, you know, I can't be more aggressive than, and, and they are outstanding. They're doing a, a, a terrific job, and, and uh, you know, I can't give you an exact time frame, but it's going to be as quickly as possible. But it, to Kevin's point, if we have four that have passed muster, for this one thousand to fifteen thousand dollar, or excuse me, a gallon per day category, why aren't we requiring that as opposed to leaving it up as an option? I, I, I think you will see those things happen very soon. And, and Kevin, to answer your question, we will use the highest technology available. Mr. Levine. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Please. Uh, you've all heard the word PDD, Plan Development District, right? Yeah, yep. uh, and you know, you go, oh, it's a terrible thing these plan development districts. It is a planning tool that does, amongst other things, it gives us an opportunity to evaluate a project, but it gives us an opportunity to also require the kind of systems that Kevin is talking about. And the two PDDs that we have approved. Uh, in my time as supervisor and Councilwoman Fleming, as part of these decisions, required these state of the art uh, uh, wastewater treatment plants uh, as part of the approval process. So, as much as you hear terrible things about these planning development districts, what they are is they're opening the door, and I'm not saying they're across the board, they're a good or a bad thing, but in these two cases, one was an affordable housing project and the other one was an important economic development project in Hampton Bay. We made it a, a, a condition of approval that one of these four systems that Kevin is talking about had to be part of, of, of that development. And to me, that opens the door to requiring that for development over a certain size, whether it's a PDD or not. And something I'd like to get done in my next 87 days. <laughs> but who's counting? All right, uh, we, we have one more question before we're going to lose uh, the county executive here, Mr. Levine. Thank you. Um, my name is Jay Levine. I'm a member of the Surf Rider Foundation, and I'm the person who goes out in all kinds of weather once a week 
to collect the 150 samples that we have, the 150 data samples that we have over two and a half years, uh, demonstrating the problem of pollution at South, South Lake Montauk. Larry, Larry spoke very eloquently about the importance of clean water in our community, shellfish, swimming, recreation, etc. Um, I'm a little concerned about the tone of the discussion that we've had over the last two hours. I've had the feeling that we need, the, the tone is, let's wait a few years, let's kind of see what's coming down the pike, let's not make a bad decision now. Um, I'm concerned about that tone for two reasons. Number one, if I adopted that tone, I would still be using a typewriter and an adding machine. And I suspect none of you are using a typewriter and an adding machine. Number two, I've worked in healthcare my entire career. And when Larry was describing the importance of, of clean water, and I know the data that indicates pollution, I say we have a cancer here. We have a cancer that could kill our community. The question is, do we want to wait five or 10 years until the National Institutes of Health comes up with the best solution? If I had cancer, I'd want to start treatment tomorrow. I'd like to know what, in your minds, we can do to address this problem. Larry said we've already identified the, the septic systems that are at risk. We've had five inches of rain in three days. I suspect they're mostly in groundwater, sending the effluents, is that the right word? Sending the effluents, God knows where. What can we do now to start the cancer treatment? Hi, so I'm uh, uh, Councilwoman Bridget Fleming from uh, the town of Southampton, and I just wanted to follow up on that question of what we can do now. One of the PDDs that we approved um, for downtown uh, Hampton Bays includes a permeable reactive barrier. We also have, uh, we, Cornell and the county presented to us a grant application that they are pursuing for a permeable reactive barrier in um, Riverhead, near where the big fish kill was. And it's just, co it's not coincidental, it's a, it's a very highly at risk area on the Peconic River there. Um, and so, although we have to focus with our long-term planning on reducing uh, nutrient input, without a doubt, the permeable reactive barrier is a solution that could be installed in certain at-risk locations immediately to start to filter out what's already contaminating the groundwater. So there are you know, grant opportunities and folks like Cornell, I'm sure you all are involved, Surf Rider, can pursue these grant opportunities and maybe we can start to use that limited technology. It's not gonna solve everything, but it is a possibility of stopping what's in the groundwater from getting into the surface water. So, uh, thank I, I, you. Can, can I add to that? Because I, yeah. I think that, that when we're talking about what any one of us can do immediately, <laughs> including us as your, your, your electeds, but also everyone else as a community, I, I think you're hearing some very proactive stuff. I mean, you're ta we're talking about understanding what are the best solutions for where so that we, we do use a permeable barrier system where that makes sense to do it. Uh, and one of the things that the, that the county has done that I think is hugely important here are these pilot programs uh, and working with the community in, in, in identifying them so that the systems that are already uh, out there and working better than what is in your ground today are being tested. And, and we're, we've all been talking about you know what what neighborhoods would be interested in partnering uh, with the county and testing these. Uh, we have information about that on our website, things like that, because we, we do know that there is a low cost way to do it because we have manufacturers today that are wanting to test uh, their, their components in our neighborhoods today and need willing homeowners um, to act as partners on that. So that's a, that's a, a thing that's out there, it's happening right now. Um, we're, we're having to deal with a little bit of the liability around all that and the cost around that, but, but the county has been very proactive in rolling out uh, this pilot program and looking at uh, partners in, in the neighborhood to do that. And I think that's a huge one. I also want to mention another little thing, but I think it's an important one. Uh, we funded through our budget uh, last year 
uh, a, a uh, nitrogen footprint program. Remember we all did our, our uh, carbon footprint thing and everyone could figure out what, they're, what they were doing bad and could do better. Uh, and so again, Chris Goldler at uh, Stony Brook is rolling out with his students a nitrogen footprint plan that we are going to post on our website and any other community can, can, uh, can use it. Uh, and where you will be able to look at, as an individual, what can I do better? So don't flush your pharmaceuticals down, uh, your toilet, don't flush your nail polish remover on your cotton balls down your toilet, things like that. Uh, where you can you can start to change your habits. So I think there are there are actually a lot of proactive things going on uh, without wanting to to waste money that we then will not be able to recoup. So I'm going to be very brief because my wife is going to kill me if I don't get up island very soon. <laughs> I'm supposed to be somewhere, and I am definitely going to be late at this point. Jay, uh, I am. Uh, so sorry that you come away from this conversation uh, feeling any sense of despair. Um, from my perspective, I would hope that you should come away from this conversation feeling very hopeful. Um, you know, I, I, I came into a county government that when I talk to the water quality people, th that essentially they feel like that we've been managing the decline for 25 years, for the last 25 years, less time than water resources management plan. I don't believe in that. I believe in accountability. I believe in people should hold me accountable. And I believe in identifying what the problems are and then saying, we're going to solve it. And then here are the things we're going to do. Boom, boom, boom. So that has happened in the last two years now, where we literally have gone from managing sort of the decline of our water quality and just sort of testing it. You know, you know, looking at the, the issues in different places to say, no, 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 we're not going to shrug our shoulders, we're not going to say the problem's too big, the federal government's not, you know, funding infrastructure anymore. We're going to say, what can we do right now? What are the, what's the progress we've made? And look, we've secured $400 million in, in the last year uh, to move for, forward the water quality. We've identified multiple systems. We, we are testing those systems. Testing different uh, uh, systems and technology. We have the Stony Brook uh, incubator that, that is there. We're uh, we're working with the contractor base right now to get them going. We're developing programs to uh, move water quality. So this is happening really at a rapid pace now, and I I would want you to come away hopeful um, and and feeling like for the first time in a really long time there are a lot of great things happening around this issue. And it's gotten to this point because of people like you and organizations like this who have been, you know, sort of calling the alarm for a long time. It takes government a while to catch up uh, to that, but it is there. And we are really making great progress at this point, and it's going to keep, keep happening. We have cancer. Do no harm. You got to know what you're doing. Do no harm, right? You got to know what you're doing, too. I agree with you. I agree with you, but I disagree with you. And, and one other thing, too, that I think is happening that everyone can participate in, and that is the shellfish and eelgrass restoration uh, programs that are going on. They're very important. They work very well. You have trustees in East Hampton. Just uh, Thank you. And everyone can help participate in that. And we've worked hard through local government to support those programs. Um, and that's something that everyone can do. And uh, you know, the trustees are working hard on that. Okay, so I, um, I, I think we probably get kicked out of here in about five minutes. But why don't we take just uh, maybe two more questions? Mike, I saw your hand up. Okay, did you want to respond to that, Larry? Yeah, uh, Mike, I saw you back there. I might be okay without a microphone. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, in light of the shellfish uh, mentioned there, uh, I'm Mike Martinson, and I'm the co-owner of Montauk Shellfish Company. We grow Montauk pearl oysters uh, in Lake Montauk. And uh, we're bringing to market over a million oysters a year now. Um, every one of those oysters that's consumed has permanently removed nitrogen from the bay. And um, I just want to bring to light that to the public awareness that um, 
oyster reef restoration could be a very vital resource, especially down South Lake. And um, our company would be very much interested in expanding our grow out uh, for commercial production, but also we are environmentalists and we'd be willing and interested in using our skills to help mitigate the situation down uh, South Lake area. Maybe people could sponsor an oyster or something like that. You know, we could, uh, you know, produce many, many millions of oysters that are cleaning the water. You know, uh, years ago, our natural filter, our the liver of the ocean, were the oysters and the clams in the estuaries, and they're gone. You know, we have large schooners that were filling their decks for decades and decades, and um, you know. Uh, I don't attribute the lack of oyster population so much to overfishing from those large schooners and uh, dredge boats. I attribute the lack of shellfish to the very problem that we're addressing here today, which is septic, the septic situation. Um, so, one- It is for the question. Mark. The question is, <laughs> would, would the town be interested in using our uh, skills to help mitigate the situation with, uh, with a bioremediation plan of uh, oyster reef restoration in Lake Montauk. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I hope that uh, public would support that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Please go ahead. Hang a minute. I'm the also, my wife is a volunteer back at the hospital and she's going to Part of the breast cancer uh, center there. There's a fundraiser tonight in East Hampton that she's part of, and I need to be there 